All right, so today we're going to wrap up the evolution notes. So the first thing we're going to talk about is types of speciation. So keep in mind, what is speciation? The speciation is the development of separate species. And yesterday we talked about how if two organisms or two groups of organisms no longer can interbreed with one another and make fertile offspring, we would consider them separate species. So these are just two vocabulary words that have to do with sort of how the speciation happens. So allopatric speciation is when they become separate species during a time that they are separated. And they gave a great example here. So you have a, an earthquake come through and it separates these two groups of trees. And over time, due to natural selection, genetic drift, mutations, whatever, eventually these are separate species. And even if they come in contact with one another, let's say this gets filled in and they're no longer able to breed with one another, they would be separate species. And so this is called allopatric speciation because it happened during a time at which they were geographically isolated or separated from each other. The other kind is called sympatric. So sympatric speciation happens while they're still in contact with each other. Typically, this one refers to plants because if you think about it, if you have an animal that's born with a mutation that it can't mate with anybody around it, how's it going to possibly form any offspring? And therefore, you wouldn't actually get a new species. The animal would just die eventually and it would never pass its genes on. But plants are a little bit different. If you were to get a plant that's polyploid, for example, meaning it has extra sets of chromosomes, it might not be able to breed with any of the plants around it, but most plant, not most, I shouldn't say that, a lot of plants make both sperm and eggs, meaning you only need one plant and that plant could make sperm and it could make eggs and it could fertilize itself. And then the seeds that would fall would grow into other plants. So you would end up with a whole community of plants. Now these might not be compatible with the plants around them, therefore they are now a separate species. So this is much more commonly seen sympatric in plants. I'm sure there's probably some example I could come up with where you could see it in animals, but it makes a lot more sense that it could happen in plants or any organism that could self-fertilize because you would only need one born with that mutation, making it not compatible with anything around it, and it would be able to pass that on. Whereas a sexually reproducing organism that is selectively male or female, just having one of them born, if it can't mate with anybody around it, it's not going to be able to pass it on. So you're not going to have a separate species. You're going to have one organism. It's going to live its life. It's going to die. And that's the end of it. Um, okay. Adaptive radiation. So this is a special case. Um, again, there's sort of key words that you want to look for. And that's the thing with this chapter is that there's a lot of vocabulary. It's not difficult, but it, you just have to know the vocabulary. So adaptive radiation is a specific time when species form when um, it, it always will mention an island chain that's really, really important. And the fact that there's a lot of different areas with different features with no competition. So the most common example of this, the sort of textbook example of this is what are called Darwin's finches. So imagine this, you have a mainland finch that lives on this island. Um, and something happens that some of these mainland finches get blown by the wind or whatever to all these separate islands. So now you have these groups of finches, but they're isolated from one another. Now, even within the islands, some of them settle in the forests, some of them settle on the beach, some of them settle in the rocks, and there's no competition. There's, you know, there's plenty of food. And so all these finches just sort of grow and they start reproducing and they start living in their areas. Now, imagine this, living in the forest, certain traits are going to be favorable, maybe being darker because you blend with the trees, maybe having a sharper beak because you can peck the wood. Um, but those that are living on the beach, a different set of traits are favorable. Uh, and so on each of these islands, you have these finches all living in different areas. And what we see is natural selection, but again, not natural selection for the same traits. Natural selection for certain traits in this area, different traits in this area, different traits in this area. And, um, and then in addition to that, add in a few mutations that happen. And these are small groups, so maybe a little bit of genetic drift going on. And so all kinds of things acting on these finches. Over time, what you might find are multiple species. And in the case of Darwin's finches, I believe there are 13 different species of finches today that we think all originated from that original ground finch. So uh, this is called adaptive radiation. So one species ends up scattered along these islands, 
depending on where each group settles, based on what they eat and you know what is going to be protective for them from predators, what's going to help them catch their food better, each group of finches in these different areas is going to be acted upon by all those evolutionary forces. Random mutations, genetic drift, uh, natural selection, and each of these things is going to lead each individual group to become different from a lot of the other groups around, and to the point where we end up with a whole bunch of separate species. Uh, so even though Darwin's finches are sort of the textbook example, here are some pictures with some others. So on the left you see Darwin's finches, all the different species, they live in different areas. Notice their beaks are different, their coloration is different, they also have different feet. Um, and the picture on the bottom left is the skulls of some of these different finches. Uh, top right are Hawaiian honey creepers. Again, Hawaii, a bunch of islands. And so you see these, these birds got separated, and then through all the evolutionary forces, they ended up different. And this last picture are African cichlids. Now, obviously, cichlids don't live on islands because cichlids are living in water, but the same idea happened in Africa with these lakes. These lakes became separated, and it's, so it's almost like a little water island, if you think of it, and then each of these uh, became different species through um, natural selection and all these other things. So this is specifically called adaptive radiation where these species uh, form, many different species form from one original, it's always because they are scattered over an island chain with very little competition and they can move into different areas and then evolutionary forces act on them. All right, the tempo of speciation has to do with sort of the rate at which it happens. And there are two different um, tempos. Both of these happen. Um, it's not like one is right and one is wrong. Gradualism is what Darwin came up with. Remember, he was in the Galapagos Islands, he saw the turtles, are the tortoises, and when he looked into the cliff sides, he saw ancient tortoises, and slowly over time, he saw little changes that had happened. And so he would have said that evolution happens at a slow and steady rate. You know, if you were gonna graph what he said happened, you would have seen the change in the tortoises, little changes leading up to the tortoise of today. But another guy, I believe it's Jay Gould, came up with his own idea, and he said, actually, what he saw in the fossil record was punctuated equilibrium, that when things are going well and everybody's sort of suited to the environment, we don't see much change at all because the organisms are sort of fitting with their environment. So evolution sort of favors stabilizing selection. So we would see kind of a stable, no changes. Then during a period of crisis, maybe the environment changes, like it's an ice age or a landslide or a meteor hits or whatever. We see a whole bunch of changes um, and a bunch of new organisms appear and we see all kinds of changes happen. And then as these uh, organisms you know, become more fit to their environment, some become extinct, some, you know, change, we see a period of no changes again. And then the next time there's some kind of environmental crisis, a whole bunch of changes, and then everything stays the same. And the fossil record shows that this has happened too. We see, for example, the dinosaurs living for long periods of time with very little change, and then all of a sudden, 65 million years ago, something happened, maybe a meteor hit that blocked out the sun, and all these dinosaurs died because there wasn't any food, and all of a sudden we see a bunch of fossils of all kinds of new mammals and birds and things because the competition is gone. And so, um, you know, the, the land was open for them and we see a whole bunch of them appear and then they don't change for long periods of time. And so these spurts of change followed by periods of no change are called punctuated equilibrium. And neither one of these is necessarily right or wrong. We have a fossil show that both of these have happened over time. In some cases, there's been slow, steady changes and in some cases, we've seen these spurts of change, particularly during times when the environment goes through a change. All right, um, and this last little section, a couple of vocabulary words here. Um, first of all, fitness. You know, when you think of somebody being fit, you probably think of the person who works out and eats the best and that they're the most fit. But keep in mind that if they're talking on a, an AP Bio question about which of these would describe the organism that was the most fit, fitness is based on how much you contribute to the next generation. In other words, if we're talking about a species, the fittest organisms in the species would be the ones who had the most babies that then lived and passed their genes on. So if I live 90 years, but I don't have any children, I would be considered in an evolutionary sense not the fittest. The person who only lived to 30 but had five kids would be more fit than me because their five kids now carry their genes into the next generation. So the most fit organism is measured by who contributes the most to the next generation as far as having the most offspring and passing their genes on. So keep that in mind. Um, the other two things I want to focus on are these two, allometric growth and homeotic genes. Sometimes we talk about, um, you know, how can we look so different from a fly? 
in some cases, um, these two things can explain that. You don't necessarily have to have completely DNA, different DNA than another organism to look very different from that other organism. You only need changes, because when we think of, of our genes, we're thinking about, oh, hair color. If a gene makes somebody have green hair, you know, that's a, that, that would change them. Um, but yes, we can have changes in hair color and eye color and blood type, and these things don't, don't, aren't obvious. But changes in allometric growth genes, which are more um, epigenetics in some ways. So think of the growth, the, the allometric growth as the switches that turn genes on and off. Remember like in operons in the bacteria, you have these switches turning things on and off. If um, a human baby and a human chimp, when they're born, our skulls are very, very similar. Genetically, we have very similar genes for coding for the making of our teeth, the making of our jaw, the making of our, of our skull bones. But we have differences in those switches that turn those genes on and off. So as a chimp grows up, its skull grows differently than ours. Let me show you a picture of what I mean. So here's the baby chimp and the baby human, and our skulls are very similar. But if the switch codes for the jaw growing for a longer period of time in the chimp, and it codes for our upper skull growing for a longer period of time, as adults, we would look very different because of allometric growth differences, changes in the rate at which and for the time during which different body parts grow. And so maybe chimps end up with much longer arms than we do because the genes um, that the switches turning on the genes, you know, those activators and repressors and things are different. Um, and I like this one too, you know, the fact that a baby, a quarter of their size is their head. So obviously if our entire bodies grew at the same rate all our lives, we would be giant bobbleheads at this point. Instead, our body parts grow at different rates. So by the time we're an adult, you know, our head is only about an eighth of our body length, not a quarter of our body length. And, and I like this too, why ligers are so big. So it turns out that a liger is a male lion. It has to be a male lion and a female tiger. It turns out that lions, the male lion produces a switch that turns on growth genes. Sort of, again, epigenetic stuff. So the genes for growing are there, but the male lion, when he passes on his chromosome, he has a switch that turns that on. Well, female lions have a growth switch that turns it off. That way, a baby lion comes out in the middle. The, it gets a growth um, push from the father's uh, side. It gets a growth stop from the mom's. A female tiger does not have the off switch. So the liger comes out and just keeps growing. They get humongous because it's getting that growth switch on from the lion, but not the off switch from the tiger. And interestingly, if you do the opposite cross, and cross a male tiger with a female lion, you don't get a, t a liger. You get what's called a tigon, and a tigon is different. Tigons have a different stripe pattern, and they're also much smaller because they're not getting that on switch from the male lion. Instead, they're getting the off switch from the female lion. And so differences in size and things like that go back to epigenetics, the genes that turn things on and off. And finally, Hox genes. So Hox genes are these genes that control the placement of our body parts. So if you think of, for example, the fact that our eyes are on the front of our head, that gives us stereoscopic vision. The eyes in a reptile, if you just change one Hox gene, you could have the eyes grow on the sides of the head instead. So now that would completely change how you, how you hunted for your food and how you lived your, your life. Um, another one is Hox genes controlling where do your legs come from. So if you think of amphibians and reptiles, the legs come from the side of the body. But in mammals, the legs come out from the bottom of the body. So that completely changes how an organism's lifestyle would go. Um, and Hox genes control things like the number of vertebrae in the neck. So you change a Hox gene and suddenly you have a long neck like a swan as opposed to a shorter neck like a chicken or a longer neck like a giraffe. You don't have to change lots and lots of genes to change the organisms. If you change allometric growth genes, you're gonna completely change the shape of head and things like that. And if you change Hox genes, you might change the location of the legs, the location of the eyes, uh, the number of vertebrae in the neck, major changes to the placement of body parts that would completely change the organism. Um, and this picture shows, uh, on the right, shows how we have similar Hox genes in certain areas uh, that flies do. We've found these Hox genes are highly conserved throughout evolution. We have some in common with just flies and other organisms.